Good morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church. It's great to see all of you this morning. So good to welcome our adults. So good to welcome our youth. So good to welcome our children. It really is nice to be together. Thank you for choosing to be part of worship here today. We would love to know that you've been here, so I thank you in advance for you uh, sharing information with us through the attendance pad, sharing it with others. Our goal is to be able to reach out to you with ministry opportunities, and this is one way that we're able to do that, so thank you so much. Some of you today perhaps have been visiting with us for a while. You know that we always offer an opportunity at the end of every service for any of you who would like to, to become a member of our church. Today is no different. Dr. Smith will give that invitation. And if you'd like to become a member of this congregation, you can fill out this card called How to Join. It should be close by. Dr. Brewster's sermon this morning is entitled, Whom Do You Serve? And it's been making me think about service throughout the day. And so thinking about the things that you have in your insert about ministry opportunities, here are just a handful of things that are related to service. One of those would be our form of service through the Giving Tree program, our relationship with T.A. Sims Elementary School. That begins today. There's information on the insert, and I believe that you can find uh, examples of the Giving Tree in the narthex, out in the garden, and even in room 147 across from Wesley Hall. So please know that you can be a part of that today. I also want to thank all of you that have been part of the Thanksgiving basket program. That obviously is another important form of service. It's amazing to think that for $30, a $30 gift for many of us, that enables a family to be able to enjoy Thanksgiving. And uh, we continue to receive those this week. Next week on Monday and Tuesday, the Thanksgiving baskets will be assembled and then delivered to 800 families. So uh, thank you for your so service in that area. And finally, thank you for your service in being willing to have your picture taken and be part of the pictorial directory. It really is a service to one another because the more we know each other, the easier it is to be in service. So please do, if you haven't done it yet, you can contact Sammy Dunn. Her email address and phone number uh, is available for you today. Would love to see your picture in the new directory. Well, it's time for us to begin worship. And as we always do, we want to take a moment to stand, to turn toward others, to say good morning, to offer the peace of Christ, and then to remain standing for our processional hymn. Would you please do that? Good morning. You're invited to participate in the morning worship service of First United Methodist Church in downtown Fort Worth, Texas.
I invite you to turn back to the bulletin so that we can join together now in our opening prayer. Loving God, surround us with your presence so we may breathe deeply of this moment and discover a fountain of joy, a river of life, a stream of hope. Come in word and silence, in song and prayer, and visit us with your peace and power, that your kingdom might be served. Amen. Please be seated. It is a sacred time in the life of a church and in the life of a family, the baptism of our little ones. And this morning I would invite Tracy and Cameron Moore to bring their daughter forward for infant baptism. Beloved of God, baptism is a sign to us of the mercy and the grace of God. It is a sacrament indicating that we do not come into this relationship on the basis of anything that we have done or accomplished, but simply on the basis of God's acceptance of us and gracious invitation to us. Infant baptism is an especially appropriate demonstration of this grace as we remember the words of Jesus when he said, let the little children come to me, for to such as these belongs the kingdom of God. 
And I ask you now, as you stand before God in this congregation, do you affirm your faith in Christ? And do you promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, all nations, and all races? And will you nurture Sidney Molly in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? I don't have a delicious uh, <laughs> necklace. Sydney Molly, I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now if you all will place your hands on her as well. Sydney Molly, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of water and the Spirit, you will remain a faithful disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. So let's turn around so you can see everybody. <clears throat> we'll head this way. Sydney Molly is the newest member of the household of faith, and we welcome her as part of our church family uh, today. Do you see this new member of your church family here? Hi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we also participate in this holy sacrament as we pledge ourselves along with her parents to do all that we can to nurture her and uphold her in the faith uh, so that as she grows up among us she'll come to the place in her life where she stands at this or perhaps some other altar makes her own profession of faith in Christ and all this is God's wonderful gift offered to us without price let us respond together with God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that Sidney Molly, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. I'd like to invite the children to come down to our usual spot for our time together. Come on. this side today. Barely, just barely, but I think we'll fit on this side. Yeah. All right, everybody else? Oh, here come a few more. All right. Well, today we're going to talk about a story about serving, and it's a, also a listening game. Who here likes games? Do you like games? If you like games, blink your eyes three times. Ready? Go. If you like games, flare your nostrils three times, ready, go. If you like games, wiggle your lower intestine three times, ready, go. Good, wow, you're really trying, I can tell, I appreciate that. All right, well, here's how the game works. It's about serving, and every time you hear the word serve, served, or serving, I want you to make the sign language sign for serve. And here's how it goes, you ready? Like this, uh-huh. That's right. It looks like Mr. Mark when I tried to do the robot dance in junior high school or last week at a reception. Okay? That's right. So when I say serve, served, serving, you make the sign. Okay? So I'm going to try to trick you. So you've got to listen really closely. Are you ready? Are you? Yes. 
Okay, well, here we go. After Jesus went into heaven, his disciples continued to devote themselves to serving God. Very good. They served God by healing the sick, and they served God by preaching and praying. One day, the disciples learned that some of the widows in the community were not getting enough food to eat. Who would serve them? Very good. I thought I had you that time. The disciples were so busy serving through healing, preaching, and prayer that they couldn't do it all by themselves. They needed help. So they, they chose seven helpers to serve God by going out to help the widows have enough to eat. So many good people serving God and God's people. So many ways to serve. How will you serve God today. Let us pray. Repeat after me. Dear God, help us to know there are so many ways to serve you. One of the best ways to serve you is to serve others. Amen. Have a great day. Answer me when I call, O God of my right. Hear me, Lord, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord. Be gracious How long, O people, shall my honor suffer shame? But know that the Lord has set apart the righteous as God's own. Be angry, but do not sin. Offer right sacrifices. There are many who say, Oh, that we might see some good. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when they have their grain and wine abound. In peace I will lie down to sleep, for you alone, stand as we affirm our faith together. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God, the truth. 
God of love, do we ever pause quietly and long enough to hear your still, small voice speaking words of love and encouragement, calling to us? Or are we, gracious God, walking either carelessly or with too much care through our daily duties and diversions, not paying much attention so that we lose sight of the path you have set before us, a path that brings us before your beautiful presence. In our hymn, we sing of echoes of mercy and whispers of love that fill the air so quietly they can be missed. And so we pray that you would calm us, center us, that our spirits could be lifted up, that hope might become more evident even in the midst of our problems, that joy could be felt even in the midst of struggle. We remember Jesus saying to Martha, who was occupied with so many things, that there was really only one thing needed. And so we pray that we could remember in all times and in all places that you are with us, that you call us to a life of love and compassion for all people, that the way we live out our days is our testimony to your healing presence in our world. We know this through the life and teachings of Jesus, and we join now to pray as he taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Our scripture reading today comes from the Hebrew scriptures, Joshua 24. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons Abraham and Naor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave you a land on which you had not labored and towns that you had not built, and you live in them. You eat the fruit of vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Now, therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our, in our sight. He protected us along the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourself that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. He said, Then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and him we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made statues and ordinances for them at Shechem. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. It doesn't happen as often as you might think that a text from a hymn writer meets a, a tune from a composer at the same time. In fact, there are multiple instances of great hymns of the faith where that's not the case at all. Um, Hark the Herald Angels Sing is one of Charles Wesley's great hymn texts. It took a hundred years for somebody to, to discover it and decide that it d uh, deserved a great tune to be put into a hymn book. Uh, our middle hymn is, no, is, a, a, is the exception to the rule. Uh, because the two women that wrote this uh, were not just contemporaries, but were actually really good friends in uh, New York back in the 1800s. Fanny Crosby and Phoebe Knapp combined to make uh, this really exquisite hymn of the faith um, that at the time they probably didn't know would be in hymnals for many, many, many years to come. And the truth is, uh, I don't know that we could imagine a hymn book without blessed assurance in it. It is considered to be one of the top five or ten uh, most popular hymns in all the world. But more importantly than any of that uh, is that these two friends sat down to write this hymn. One of them was blind, and so she had to listen to the melody a couple of times in order to get it in her ear, but uh, she famously said that any time a good text and a good tune meld together, good songs will ensue. And so um, she played it, uh, Phoebe played it twice for Fanny. Fanny, blind, uh, sat and just sort of thought about the rhythms and the, uh, the way the text should flow and literally sat down and penned, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. 
Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. You'll even notice in the second verse she uses the word sight, which is really interesting. She was a, an incredible hymn writer, wrote over 8,000 hymns in her lifetime, which is just astounding for somebody that could see, much less somebody that could only hear. Would you please stand as we celebrate hymn 369, Blessed Assurance. Thank you so much, Taylor. The, those uh, uh, moments when you teach us about the hymns uh, are really informative, and uh, we learn a lot, and it helps us to uh, understand the meaning of the hymns uh, better, too, and we appreciate that very much. Today, we hear from Joshua, who has led the people into the land of Canaan, and they are establishing their lives there. This is the land that God had promised to their ancestors. And as they are establishing their lives there, they reaffirm the covenant with God. Um, they make a covenant with God. Uh, in fact, the word, the Hebrew word that uh, is translated make really is the word to cut. Uh, so they are cutting uh, a covenant. And it, that word is used because in covenant making, this very solemn ceremony, an animal would be sacrificed, cut in two, and then the parties making the covenant would walk between the two halves. An odd ceremony for us to imagine, a strange way of making agreement uh, or a covenant, but that was the tradition, and so they cut uh, a covenant. It, it was a moment of making a decision to go one way or the other. Uh, and and uh, that word decide, by the way, also has at its roots the word to cut. Think of the word incision. Uh, to cut something away, to decide something, is to part with something else. 
to make a decision is to kill off another option. And so you can hear the word side as an insecticide in the word as well. So it's to cut or to kill, to make a decision. Now I mention that because we all know making decisions is not an easy thing, especially when it is a monumental decision. Now, of course, even a small decision can be difficult. Imagine standing in an ice cream shop, 39 flavors, and you walk up and down the glass and your nose is fogging up the glass as you're looking at all of those delicious flavors, and 17 of them look fantastic. But you can only choose one, or maybe two, or maybe three, if you can't narrow it to one. But you are choosing not to have all of those other flavors. Cafeteria line, you have to make choices, and everything looks good, but you have to decide. And by deciding on one thing, you have cut out another option. You have killed another option in that decision-making process. And so there's pain involved in that. But think about more important decisions. Imagine a 17-year-old sitting at a table. Uh, spread out on the table are the brochures and the pictures of the three colleges that that young person has been admitted to. They have a decision to make. And they're interested in all of those schools, and they like all those schools, and there are some things about each school that they like a lot, but they have, have to make a decision. And the pain of that decision is that they're giving up two other schools when they choose one of them. Or it's true of a trade. A person likes to weld, a person is also a carpenter, and they're passionate about both of those things, but they can only be one, and they have to make that decision. And so they kill off another option. They remove another option. They cut it away. There's pain in that. I think the poem that best expresses that is Robert Frost's The Road Not Taken, where uh, he, he says, two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood. You hear that? He wants to go down both paths. Both look good. Both that morning, he says in the poem, equally lay. In leaves, no step had trodden black. Both look good. He wants to go down both, but he can't. He has to make a decision. And so he decides. And he takes the road less traveled by, and he says at the end, that's made all the difference. But you get a hint of the pain of the decision when he entitles the poem, The Road Not Taken. There are these two roads. He takes one but he's still thinking about the one not taken because he had to kill off, he had to cut away that option. He decided. And so here is Joshua in this new land calling on the people to choose whom they will serve, whether it's the gods of their ancestors or it's the one Lord. Choose this day whom you will serve, he says. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Choose. Decide. Because to make that decision is to remove the other option. And so what he's really calling them to is to do two things. One is to choose to serve, and the other is to throw away those other gods. Now, that takes a little explaining, too. These folks are nomads. They have traveled to this place. They live in tents. And tucked away in their tents are these little household gods from the lands that they had inhabited and from their ancestors. Yes, they worship the one Lord God, this God who set them free from slavery, the God who led them in the wilderness as they wandered for uh, all of that time for 40 years in the wilderness, and, uh, and yet they still are holding on to these little household gods, little statues, sort of hedging their bets. And it's nice to have little gods that you carry where you want to go rather than having to follow where the Lord wants to go. 
So you have these little gods tucked away here and there, hidden in your tent. And Joshua knows about this, and he says, look, you need to decide. You need to do the difficult work of choosing. Who will you serve? To whom will you devote your life? To whom will you devote your energy and your passion? If it is to the Lord, then you have to throw away those little gods that are your security blanket. You have to throw away those little gods that are standing in the way of fully giving yourself to the Lord. You have to choose. You have to decide. You have to do that very difficult and painful work of cutting away in addition to taking on. Now, of course, choosing, deciding is not all about pain at all. In fact, it is choosing that enables us to really enjoy and to really be focused and to have goals in life and to have a direction in which we are headed. And so this difficult work of choosing is also enormously important and enormously life-giving as well. You choose your flavor of ice cream, you get to enjoy the ice cream. You choose your meal in the cafeteria, you get to enjoy that. You choose the college that you're going to, and in that place you have all the advantages of learning and of engagement with others and with discussion and all that comes along with college life. You choose a, a trade and you enjoy the fulfillment that you have of doing something that you truly enjoy. Um, you choose to marry someone, you are choosing to spend the rest of your life with another person and to build a family. You choose to have children and you're making a choice that is literally life-giving but also gives new life to the world and creates this new family. You choose to become a disciple of Jesus and you give up some things but you also gain this abundant uh, life and this new uh, family of, of Christians of which you are a part. You choose to join a particular congregation. And you've said, well, this is my congregation and not those others. But in doing that, you have this new experience of a community of faith in which you can be engaged and in which you are in ministry. Choosing is a powerful thing. And to choose to serve the Lord makes all the difference in the world. I think about uh, the story of Clarence Jordan. Maybe you know the name. Clarence Jordan was a Southern Baptist preacher and uh, had his PhD in, in Greek. Uh, he translated uh, the uh, New Testament into the cotton patch version of the New Testament uh, from the Greek directly into Southern English. And it's a wonderful read and it really speaks to, uh, to the conditions of the time in which he wrote that, uh, to the uh, social ills and the unrest uh, in Georgia, to the racial divides and conflicts, and the conflicts among uh, or between the rich and the poor of both uh, African Americans and uh, and uh, whites in the in the Deep South. But he heard this call to serve, and what he decided to do is to answer that call to serve in this way. He founded Koinonia Farms. Koinonia means fellowship or communion. Koinonia Farms in Americus, Georgia. And people came together from all over the place, all different backgrounds, all races, to live together to farm and the proceeds to go to help the poor. And countless lives were changed by his decision to say no to some other things that he could have said yes to and to say yes to serving God in this way. In 1964, there was a young man uh, and, and his wife, Millard Fuller was his name, age 29 at this point, had made, already made his first million dollars and uh, he was on the fast track up except that his health was was failing, the marriage was falling apart, uh, the, the, the stresses were killing him and killing their relationship. He and his wife knelt one night, literally knelt, and prayed to God and made a decision, a tough decision, 
because they decided to give away all that they had to the poor and to go and to live at Cornelia Farms. They did that. Imagine that decision. It's hard to comprehend the pain of the decision of giving away, putting away, throwing away all of the plans, all of that life that they had been pursuing, all that they had in mind for themselves, to put all of that aside and to go to America's Georgia to serve in what way they did not know. But Millard Fuller soon received the call, the call in his life to do something about affordable housing. And so he founded Habitat for Humanity. And now, think of it, hundreds of thousands of people have had homes that would not have had them. Because he said yes to serving the Lord, and the best way, as Mr. Mark said to the children, will go to serve the Lord is to serve people. Jesus said, if you do it to the least of these, my brothers and my sisters, you have done it to me. And he made the decision to do that. And because of his decision, many, many lives were changed. Because of Clarence Jordan's decision, Millard Fuller's life was changed. And because of Millard Fuller, people sitting in this congregation right now who put on hard hats, take up the hammer and the saw, and go to a, uh, a Habitat for Humanity work site and, and work uh, to help provide a home. Uh, because of all of these decisions to serve God, the world is a better place. And I can think of so many examples. I think of a, a guy that I know who uh, by midlife was very successful and continues to be an entrepreneur. He's done many, uh, many different things. But he, he uh, felt like he needed to serve in some way, to serve in a way that really suited his gifts and his graces and what he was able to do, his abilities. And he decided, feeling very strongly that people need uh, a hand up that they need the tools uh, to uh, care for themselves with dignity and to, uh, and to provide for themselves and their family. Feeling very strongly about that, he decided to start mentoring people. Uh, those who didn't have the education they needed to uh, bring themselves up out of poverty, he would mentor them and help them do their financial planning and to make a plan to get their education. And many, many people have done that or to start a small business, or to get a job, uh, or, or simply to manage their finances in such a way that they can build a better future. In other words, he has given life to people, a new life to many people, uh, enabled them to provide themselves with that life simply because he said yes to serving people and serving God in that way. The question for us is, whom do we serve? Uh, to whom are we devoted with our lives and with all that we have and all that we are? And are there other little household gods hanging around, tucked away in our own lives, in corners here and there, hidden in different places, that which stands in the way of our full relationship with God and that which prevents us from stepping out in faith and serving as God is calling us to do. Jesus was really clear about, uh, about this choice business. He said no one can serve God and mammon. That is stuff. Wealth can be translated in different ways. You can't serve God and mammon. He said no one can serve two masters. You love the one, hate the other. You're devoted to one, you despise the other. You have to choose the one you will serve. So our call today is to go through our lives and to think, what am, what's tucked away that I'm relying on that's not very reliable? What, what's tucked away in a corner of my life that I just can't let go of that's preventing me from living life to its fullest? See, the good news of our faith is that God has the ability to enable us to let go of that which we need to let go, to throw it away, 
and to take on uh, this new life that he offers us in Christ. There's an urgency in Joshua's voice. Choose today whom you will serve. As for me and my household, Joshua says, we will serve the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious God, we hear clearly your call to serve you, to decide. And we confess that uh, that decision is one that we face quite often. In large ways and small ways. And we confess that we feel the pain of it when we realize what we must let go of in order to be faithful as your people in the world today. Give us your grace, O oh God, that we might choose to serve you with all that we have and with all that we are. In Jesus' name, amen.
Gracious God, we choose faithfulness, and we choose generosity, and we pray our gifts will bless the lives of your children. In Jesus' name, amen. We invite to the chancel you who would become a part of our church family this morning. We've had a beautiful um, music experience, haven't we? And a wonderful sermon. And if you're looking for a church home, this is the best one you could find. So come forward as we sing our hymn of invitation. see Michael Dixon come uh, Sunday after Sunday to be the first friend of our new members. He doesn't join every Sunday. He just comes down to support our new members. And this couple here who will be married uh, one of these days, one comes from a, uh, an Episcopal uh, background and one comes from a Baptist background. They are Jim Griffiths and Lindsay Rogers. And I tell people the Methodist church is the best place for Episcopalians and Baptists to get together. <laughs> and they believed me. And here they are, and we're delighted to have them come today. Yeah, in fact, there is a saying, as long as Episcopalians marry Baptists, there will always be Methodists. So, <laughs> <clears throat> Welcome to, to y'all. And I ask you, as you become a part of this congregation, do you reaffirm your faith in Christ? And will you be loyal to the church and uphold it by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Well, welcome. Welcome again to you. And I want to ask them to stay down front and give you an opportunity to come and to welcome them as well as the newest members of our church family. Our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen. Thank you.